Well, good evening. Happy Sabbath. And we're going to begin our study with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for the Sabbath and for the things that you have brought us through, the experience you've brought us through in this past week. And um, we ask, Lord, that we can enter into your rest as we cease from our own works, as Christ did from his, as you, when he created this world. Help us, Lord, to trust in you. Um, we ask for your peace that you promise that we can ride upon the high places of the earth and that we can be fed with the heritage of Jacob, our father. We ask, Lord, that we can have a faith that endures. We need your presence now as we open your word together, as we look at past history, uh, the message from A.T. Jones. And we ask, Lord, that you can bring to remembrance the things that we've studied already that we can make sense out of them and that they will bring a conviction in our lives and a power uh, that we may reflect your character. Be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, happy Sabbath again. So this study of A.T. Jones. This is the 1895, 1893 General Conference Bulletin. And we're halfway through, or more than halfway through, his fourth article, his fourth sermon. And we know that we've, just to sort of review, what we see is that there is this parallel uh, to Jones' time and ours, in that uh, there he believes that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 is coming down and that he's in the time of the loud cry and that they have to give a message and that the next thing coming is the Sunday law. And Ellen White appears to see that this work is being done, that there is this true loud cry message that's bringing about a conviction and a conversion. But also at this same time, there is a false loud cry message going on um, and um, Brother Stanton and Brother Caldwell, uh, who are looking at what's happening at this World's Fair, so they're looking at world events, and they're seeing things that are incorrect. So they're making some incorrect observations. They don't. Uh, they make some observations. At least Caldwell does about uh, the first month the former and the latter rain. So he believes the former and latter rain are being poured out. So, so we have something that's true and something that's false happening at the same time. But we also know that Jones um, sees something happening, but it doesn't happen the way that he expects. And that is because he doesn't realize that he's in a typical history. And we are in a typical history as well. But there's a difference between Joan's perspective and Brother Caldwell's and Stanton's perspective. Even though they both believe they're in a loud cry, there's a difference between their messages. Now, can we describe what the difference is? Do we know enough to know what the difference is between Brother Caldwell's message and Jones' message, based on what Ellen White has said. What's the difference? Based on what Ellen White said. Okay, I'm going to read these here uh, again, just to remind us, because this is, is pretty important uh, to understand this history. 
Ellen White says, uh, both these men, Brethren Stanton and Caldwell, were at the general conference. So they're going to have been there when Jones had been presenting. Could they not discern there the revelations of the Spirit of God? Could they not see that God was opening the window of heaven and pouring out a blessing? Testimonies had been given, correcting and counseling the church, and many had made a practical application of the message to the Laodicean church, confessing their sins and repenting in contrition of soul. They were hearing the voice of Jesus speaking to them. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Brethren Stanton and Caldwell had the same work of repentance and confession to do, thus clearing away the rubbish from the door of their own hearts and making a place for a heavenly guest. This image that Ellen White's using here is one that she uses in context of the Laodicean message, that Jesus is standing at the door knocking, and our responsibility is to move the rub remove the rubbish from the door so that Christ can come have entrance and that he can clean up our hearts. Had they placed themselves in the channel of light, they would have seen that the Lord was graciously manifesting himself to his people and that the son of righteousness had arisen upon them. The counsel of Christ to the Laodicean church was being acted upon. And those who felt their poverty were buying gold, faith and love, white raiment, the righteousness of Christ, and I salve, true spiritual discernment. Why did not these brethren place themselves in the channels of light? Talking about Stanton and Caldwell. They were poverty stricken and knew it not. They were not working in Christ's lines, were not softened and subdued by the Holy Spirit, and were so blinded that they could not see the strong rays of light that were coming from the throne of God to his people. They heard not the voice of the true shepherd. They were listening to the voice of a stranger. Now, if we're going to take what Ellen White says and we're going to apply this uh, to our time, what is the difference between the messages, the true message, the true loud cry message that's being given at this time, and the counterfeit, the false? What is the difference? How do we discern the difference? Absence of self. Okay. Well, we know one work, one brings about a work that is, uh, causes a confession and repentance. One, one produces what we would call the upper room experience. The other produces a, uh, a Pharisaic experience or a papal idea right so we know that what's that it's an emotional one group is emotional emotionalism well yeah there's a sort of a sensationalism that you see and i see the thing about sensationalism is it flatters our pride You know, when we, when Adventists, at least when I first became an Adventist, and they had evangelistic series, they weren't bringing a conviction of sin to people to get them into the church. They were actually appealing to their human nature, to their pride, to the idea that if you join this group, you will be better than other people. And we saw this fruit in Adventism, at least I did, in the people who came into the church. Um, one is they like to sit. What's that? Saw it in this movement too. It's a yeah. P and T. Yeah. yeah, yeah. People are attracted to the sensational because it flatters them. It doesn't bring about a conviction of sin. It doesn't bring about confession and repentance. It it brings it it feeds human pride. And we would see this in in the type of because the type of bait you use will determine what type of fish you catch. And so the Adventist church, when I became an Adventist, I wouldn't have become an Adventist if I'd gone to an evangelistic series. Um, I, I just studied myself into Adventism on my own. But if I, when I went to my first Adventist evangelistic series, I would have been an Adventist for 
about a year and four months. And I wasn't very impressed because uh, I'm not really impressed by the sensational. And, and that's what they presented. And I saw the people that came into the church based upon these types of presentations. And so they, they were attracted to the sensational and they continued to be attracted to the sensational once they became Adventists. And the church, of course, isn't as sensational as the evangelistic series were. So they would often just go somewhere else where they could find the sensational. But we as Adventists often are attracted to the sensational. And, and that's where we would put place conspiracy theories. They're, they're sensational. They build up our pride. They don't bring about confession and repentance. They don't reconcile us to God and to our brother. Instead, they, they create a self-dependency, a, a self-pride, so that we think of our own ideas more highly than we ought. We think of ourselves as better than others. And so this message of Jones and Wagner, and, and especially here, A.T. Jones in 1893, um, is a very powerful message. It's a very spiritual message in the truest sense of the word. Now, somebody could look at this on, this on the surface and say there are things that are sensational about it. But it's the purpose of what he's bringing out and how it relates to what we should do in being prepared instead of looking at what the world is doing and just gloating over the fact that we're not like the world. And especially with Brother Caldwell to call people out of the Adventist church as he was doing back in 1893. And um, the work that was being done by Can Wright that Ellen White's talking about is already doing this work to be, see uh, these problems within the Adventist church and also with the spirit of prophecy. So, so you have this work of undermining the truth that's going on, but undermining the church as well. And, and we see this in this movement with, um, many people are attracted to the movement to the 2520 because the church doesn't like it. But whether that understanding of the 2020, 2520 is creating a conviction of sin in that person, a repentance and a confession, um, that's a whole, a whole other story. So, so that's where we are at this point in Joan's presentation. He says, now another thought. God had a church in the world and a nation in old time, did he not? Christ came to that church and that nation. He preached the gospel of God, revealing in its living principles the mystery of God, God with men, God in the flesh, God in men, the hope of glory. That is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He revealed that to them, and they would not receive it. They rejected him. They wanted to kill him. They prosecuted him for blasphemy before Pilate. But Pilate could not take judicial notice of the offense of blasphemy because that was an offense against Jewish law only. So Pilate said, take him and judge him according to your law. But they said, we have a law and by our law, he ought to die. But they could not put him to death without a decree from the Roman Empire. Pilate said, what shall I do with him? They said, crucify him. Pilate Shall I crucify your king? They replied, we have no king, but Caesar. When they said that, did they not in that reject the Lord absolutely and join themselves to Caesar? They had to join themselves to Caesar to do against the truth of God, what they could not do without it. When they turned their backs upon God, deliberately rejected him and took Caesar for their king and allied themselves to earthly power in the face of the power of God, then what more could the Lord do for them as a people, as a church, as a nation? Nothing. There were individuals in the nation. There were individuals in the church that feared God and had no part in this thing. But these, the representative men of the nation, the representative men of the church, they did that thing. They did join themselves. And in themselves, they joined the nation and the church unto Caesar 
and turned its back against God. Then the Lord could do no more for them as a church or as a nation. All he could possibly do before its absolute and irretrievable ruin swept it out of the, the world was to call out of it such as would receive him. Then he sent his message, his gospel, to those people in that day. And there were many who came from that apostate church to the knowledge of God. He called out of them a people for his name. By the gospel which Christ sent to that apostate church, people were gathered out, such as would be saved. And then he gave them a warning that they were to flee when the whole combination would be destroyed. Now, if we look at what Jones is saying here, can we see how Brother Caldwell would have been taking this? Because he's going to start believing that we need to call people out of the Adventist church in 1893. And, and we can see what Jones is saying here, that at the time of Christ, the church, which was called out of um, the organization of Judaism, uh, wouldn't we then say that what Brother Caldwell is suggesting, that we need to call people out of the Adventist church, is the correct message, and that he's really aligning with Jones? Or is there some difference here? Remember, the track of truth lies close to the track of error. What's the truth that Jones is presenting? And what would be the error that Brother Caldwell has and why it does, where does it differ? How does Jones look at coming out of the false teaching? How does, how does, he, how does he understand that we come out of a false church, an apostate church. He leave, he's understanding that we leave it behind. Okay. But what does a person have to do to come out of a false church? They have to abandon that teaching. Okay. But that's not what Jones is saying. Isn't Jones talking about the need for us to be converted? Aren't they both on similar paths? They're similar. But a person, some people believe that they can just leave the Adventist church because the Adventist church is an apostasy. And that now they're not a part of that church. That they're unlike that church because they left it but they can still be exactly like that church, church or even worse than the church that they came out of. So Jones seems to understand the principles involved in what it means to come out of the church. It means to be quite different from the church because it, it's, it results in the end um, a separation between the church, between the Jewish nation and the Christians. But who's really doing the separating? Are Christians seeking not to be Jews any longer? No. No. Right. We see the same thing with um, Martin Luther. I mean, he's not seeking to start a new church. He's not seeking to, to cease to be Catholic. But in the end, he ends up outside of the church, the Catholic church, because of the actions of the Catholic church itself. But more than that, it's the separation that occurs between him and the Catholics has to do with his connection to Christ to his understanding of the gospel. If Martin Luther had just went about to start another church and modeled it after the Catholic church and operated on the same principles as the Catholic church, would he really have come out of the Catholic church? No. 
Now, so in order to come out of Babylon, in order to call people out of Babylon, we have to be out of Babylon. We need to understand what it means to be in Babylon. And what we see when people come out of the Adventist church many times, they have, they have a worse um, papal spirit than, and you can experience it with them than you would have experienced in the Adventist church itself. And that's because they, the, the appeal that has been given, the reason that they have left the church is not because they're converted, but because they're jealous. Many people are jealous of the Adventist church. They're jealous of the people who are leaders in the church, in their local church or wherever. They really want those positions. And since they can't have them, because they're not accepted, they start their own church so that they can be in charge. They're really gonna be worse than the church as far as how they treat others. We see this happen all the time. So Jones is understanding the principles of what needs to occur, the work of the Holy Spirit to bring about a conviction of sin, a true repentance, so that we can come out of spiritual Babylon, truly, that we will not be any longer following our own desires, but that we will be connected with Christ and we will be doing his work. So there's a difference between Brother Caldwell's calling people out of the Adventist church, using Ellen White's writings, misusing them, as she says, and Joan's call to come out of a false system of worship, to come really out of Babylon, out of papalism. And he's using this example of the past, but people often take that example and misuse it. They just think if you physically get out of a church that somehow you're out of it when you haven't been converted at all. So Joan says, then the preaching of the gospel went on. But there are those prophecies, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. In Romans 1 verse 8, it is said that the genuine faith of the church at Rome was spoken of throughout the whole world. And so when she went in the way of apostasy, she became famed for that throughout the world. The apostate church was opposed to the Sabbath of the Lord and was determined to destroy it and put the false Sabbath in its place. But she could not do that of herself. And what did she have to do? In order to do it, she had to join herself to Caesar, just as the Jewish church did to get Christ, the Lord of the Sabbath, out of the way. So did the apostasy do to get the Sabbath of the Lord out of the way. Then that made her mystery Babylon the Great, that is the next thing that is said of her, and upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery, the Babylon, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, the ab and abominations of the earth. That is the church of Rome. Then there came the Reformation. God called people out of Rome by Luther, others after him. But every one of those churches joined themselves to Caesar after the example of the mother in every place where they had a chance except the Baptist church in Rhode Island. All these others joined themselves to Caesar after the example of the mother and thus became her daughters. Then arose the new Republic and by, by its total separation of the church from all connection with the state established a new order of things, which is only the order of things prescribed by the Lord for government. Thus by her fundamental and constitutional principles, this nation shut away all the churches from a union with the state. And thus it stood until 1892. But in AD 1892, the professed Protestant churches in the United States followed the example of the original apostasy of the Church of Rome. And in order to get rid of the Sabbath of the Lord and exalt the false Sabbath, in its stead, these churches joined themselves to earthly power, to the kingdom. So we see, you know, people can come out of a church but if they're not truly converted, they're just going to act in the same way 
So he's joined themselves to earthly power, to the kingdom of men, to Caesar. And do we not do the same thing? If we're not connected to Christ, are we not connected then to Caesar? Isn't there a choice between being connected to Christ and being connected to Caesar? Isn't that really the choice that's presented to all of us? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So when we look at the Sunday Sabbath issue as Seventh-day Adventists, we think that we can avoid the issue by just knowing which day the Sabbath is without being truly converted, that we can somehow just choose to be on the right side when that time comes. We can live our lives the way we want to live them, you know, as nominal Adventists, enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season. And then the Sunday law comes and we just are going to be on the Lord's side. But all through that, has the church not connected itself to Caesar? Do we not see the same papal spirit in the church that we saw in the papacy? And the people, yeah. who, and the people who are called, who come out of that, are no different. We model ourselves after the church. We do the same things. You know, an example of this, and you know, people might disagree with me, but um, when I, when I became an Adventist and I sat on nominating committees and boards, especially something like a nominating committee, and a person's name would come up. And if that person was in that room, what do we ask that person to do? To leave. Okay, why do we ask them to leave? <clears throat> because the premise of those committees is they don't want their supposedly open and frank discussion to be held in front of the person that they're nominating. And why not? Because they prefer it to be in secret. Yeah. But that person, if some charge is going to be brought against that person, shouldn't that person be present? And if we have something to say about that person that's not good, um, shouldn't we be able to say it to that person? Yes. And if we In can't say it, right, and if we can't say it to that person, we shouldn't be able to say it to other people. This goes right back to what we've been addressing on Sabbaths. Yeah. Criticizing um, others. We had one pastor. If something was brought up in a nominating committee about any person, a person not there, the pastor would ask, have you talked to the person? Have you followed the counsel? And if you haven't, we don't want to hear what you have to say. Now that's rare. You would have to agree, right? Now, for me, one of, yeah. Now, for me, um, I once did something I'm very ashamed of still to this day. In a nominating committee, when a person's name was brought up, I spoke. Now, I had talked to the person, but still. I spoke about this person in a negative way. And, and that was sufficient to have that person not considered for a position. And I'm still ashamed of it. And I still believe a lot of the things that have happened to me since then are uh, punishment, I'll put it that way, punishment for the way that I acted in that nominating committee. That in a sense, I deserve some of the things that have been said about me and that people have done because of how I acted then. But I resolved never to do that again. Because it's a shameful thing. That person should be there if I'm going to say something about them, that they can defend themselves, that they can clarify their position. It shouldn't just be accepted because somebody says something about a person. 
But we, we have modeled our church on how we do things after the world, not after Christ. Everything should be as open as the day. We shouldn't have these secrets. We shouldn't give occasion or that temptation. And in some ways, you know, I could excuse it. I could say, well, I was put in a position where I could do something. It was a temptation for me, and I took that temptation. But that should never have been offered to me, so I could maybe excuse it in that sense. But that's not an excuse. You know, we should never be put in that position where we can we are expected to and allowed to say something about a person when that person's not there. Now, it was it was brought up before. Um, maybe I can find it here, but um, <clears throat> uh, we had discussed about the idea of a following. Uh, it's Matthew. Is it Matthew twelve? Is it, I always forget the verse. Is that, that the verse that we always talk about, the council? Anybody remember what the verse is? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Are you speaking about being judged by one's words? Because that's Matthew 12, 36. I'm talking about where you go to your brother if you have something against you. Oh, that's Matthew 18. Matthew 18. 18. Okay, so Matthew 18. So the Council of Matthew 18. And um, I believe Iran sent me something about it. Um, I just can't find it here uh, because it was a while ago. But... um, but, you know, I'd made a statement about, you know, people feel justified that they can rebuke or talk about a person in public uh, because that person said something in public that they can then rebuke. But when you have somebody who's, let's say, a public figure, um, let's say somebody like me, you know, within the movement, I'm sort of a public figure. What, what a person can say is, well, all these things that Theodore said, he said in public. So I never need to go to Theodore and talk to him individually to be reconciled to him. Now, it is true that when there is public sin, that that can be talked about in public and that that rebuke can be public. But we're not talking about a person having a a character defect that we just don't like or something that annoys us. You know, if we followed Matthew 18 in all situations where we are offended by a brother in some way, maybe somebody's hurt our feelings in something that they did, and we just decided anytime that happens, I'm going to go to that brother and talk to them. A lot of... um, A lot of problems would disappear. But what we normally do is we talk about something that brother has said. Um, Yeah, so Iran says it's 1 Timothy 5.20, them that sin and rebuke before all that others also may fear. And, but that's a public sin, right? It's not, not an opinion or something that we see in a person's character, right? So if somebody commits adultery, and that's an open sin, that should be rebuked publicly. But somebody having a difference of understanding, somebody um, even having maybe a conflict with another person in a study because there's a disagreement, um, One is, wouldn't both people be responsible to some degree for that conflict? You wouldn't just isolate one person. And and it wouldn't be something that you would then shun that person because they happen to have a conflict or a disagreement with another person. And it's really just because we have personal feelings about a person. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that 
um, when we're talking about people joining themselves to Caesar, what does that entail? How does that look at the present time? Because none of us are going to the state and asking the state to do our dirty work. So how do we appeal to Caesar? What does that look like? Repeat the question so I can visualize it. So, well, if we look at the next sentence, he says, they turn their backs upon the Lord, they forsook the Lord and joined themselves to another. They turned away from the power of God and put their trust in the power of men and earthly government. So, of, of course, we don't necessarily do that. We're not talking about that, but we're talking about something that's equivalent to that. How does that look within the movement today? How does it look when we uh, join to Caesar? Because there's two different powers here, the power of God and the power of men. What's the power of God? Doing exactly what he says he will do when he says he will do it. Okay. But the Bible gives us a definition of the power of God in Romans chapter 1. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. Right. So, so if we have a... If we're going to be separated from the false church, we need the gospel. That's where our power comes from. We need the true gospel. Right, the true gospel. You know, a three-step testing prophetic message, the everlasting gospel. That's what we depend upon. And if we put our trust in the power of men, and that can be the teachings of men, the authority of men, uh, the power of men themselves, the ability to control other people. We have rejected the power of God. We have forsaken the Lord. Correct? Agreed. Because we are supposed to be seeking to win people through the gospel and to, for ourselves to be converted. And when we see a problem with our brother, that is, when we see that we're at odds with our brother, the, na the human nature wants to say, well, the problem is with the brother. But the problem, the only thing that we have control over is whether or not we are converted. If we're not converted, there isn't anything we can do about our brother. And so we should seek to be converted. That should be our first work. Are we truly converted? Have we confessed our sins? Have we recognized the things in our character that have hindered God's work? And we should be ready to see our sins and confess those sins and apologize to those that we have hurt. And that only comes from the power of God, from the gospel. But the power of men is going to seek to um, criticize, to misrepresent, to, to, to display um, antagonism towards those that we differ with that we're going to shut people out, that we're going to shun them, we're going to disfellowship them. 
that we're going to censor them. And we do it all in the name of God, that we're protecting people from error, because that's exactly what the church did when it kicked people out of the church for the 2520 or shunned them for believing the 2520. Remove them from positions just for something that they believed that they didn't even understand. They were using the power of men, not the power of the gospel. And so we, we know that if we're going to pass this Sunday law test, we have to be joined to the Lord. We have to have the power of the gospel working in our lives, the power of God. And only then can we truly be Protestants. It doesn't matter what we believe intellectually if spiritually we are unconverted. The truth, the reason we believe the truth is it's something that can affect a change in us if we allow it to. But a profession of the truth itself isn't sufficient uh, to convert us. So Jones says, these professed Protestant churches of the United States have turned their backs upon the Lord and joined themselves to Caesar, as certainly as did the Jewish church and the Romish church before it. <coughs> Excuse me. And for the same reasons and for the same purpose. And what were the reasons and what were the purpose? It was to persecute those that differed from them that were pre presenting the gospel, the power of God, that they disliked. What then? This is as certainly makes them the daughters of Babylon, as certainly as the first apostasy made Rome Babylon, the mother. And they have even said it, the Catholic Church, the mother of us all, and the Protestant Episcopal Church, the beautiful daughter of a beautiful mother, is what is leading Presbyterian paper a leading Presbyterian paper published from the pen of a doctor of divinity, in quotation marks, some, times ago, some time ago. And not one of them has ever denied it so far as I have seen or heard. But are we any different? We may know the right language and the right words to say, but are, how are we acting? So Jones goes on, he says, they say it, and it is so. Until now, these churches have not joined themselves to the powers of the earth. They had many bad ways, and they were doing many things that were out of harmony with the gospel, and they had fallen away from Christ. But a woman may leave her husband and yet not be joined herself to another man. There is hope for her still to come back to her husband. But when she has joined herself to another man, what then? She has gone completely. She is an adulteress indeed. She cannot be brought back. Although they wandered away from Christ, yet they had not joined themselves to another until 1892. Then they deliberately joined themselves to another, to the government of the United States, and seized upon the power of this nation. They made this their husband, their dependence, and source of help instead of the Lord. Are not these churches just as truly apostate as the papal church herself when she did it? Is not Babylon the mother and daughters complete? What is she the mother of? Harlots and abominations of the earth. And so they themselves are the daughters. It has been said for them and not one of them has disputed it. Then what comes next? I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Now, one of the things we know is that in Millerite history, the Protestant churches fell. 
they became part of Babylon. And we see that in Revelation 14. But in Revelation 14, is there a call to come out of her? Now, we know the Millerites made a call to come out of Babylon, but in Revelation 14 itself, is there a call to come out of Babylon? Here's what it says regarding the second angel. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. That's all it says in the second angel's message in Revelation 14. So we don't see a call to come out of Babylon in Revelation 14. Why do we see it in Revelation 18? Because this is the second angel, this other angel in Revelation 18. But why is there a call to come out of Babylon in Revelation 18, but not in Revelation 14? I think the call to come out is inferred in Revelation 14 and very, very explicit in Revelation 18. Okay. Well, it, uh, how is it inferred? I mean, I know the Millerites combined these two. So the call to come out of Babylon, they took Revelation 14 and Revelation 18 and put them together. Well, it says that in 14, it says that those who receive the mark are going to be going to be receiving the, the wrath of God. So <laughs> who would want to remain, remain in Babylon and receive the mark, the uh, wrath of God? Okay, but in Revelation 14, verse 8, it doesn't say anything about uh, receiving the wrath of God. That's going to be the third angel's message. So Ellen White says there was a moral fall in the Protestant churches, but they, they were partially, they had partially fallen, but they have a complete fall at the end of time. So is there a difference between the Protestant churches of you know, 1842, 1843, 1844, and the Protestant churches of today. That we can then say the call to come out of Babylon is, is present truth. Yeah, there's a difference now. Okay, so there is a difference. Now, the other thing that we, we looked at is we knew that there are two horns that have to fall. The first is the church, right? Republicanism and Protestantism. So Protestantism falls first in Millerite history. But the United States doesn't fall. That is the Republican horn does not fall in Millerite history, correct? Correct. So that Protestant horn has to fall in our history. Now, one of the things we see in Jones in 1893 is he sees this as Revelation 18. He would see that uh, there's a call to come out of Babylon, that the church has sought the power of the state, and the state has provided it and that the constitution has been ignored, that we don't need a uh, revision of the constitution. We don't need a constitutional convention to change the constitution, to really undo the constitution. We just need to ignore it. The governments need to ignore it. And so we can see that Jones is correct about 1893 to a large degree. But why does the Sunday law not come in the way that he expects it in 1893? We, we can see there's a work of conversion and repentance, confession 
and repentance, Ellen White says, that is occurring, that the Spirit of God is indeed working at this general conference in the messages that were given, not just by Jones, but by others. So shouldn't the Sunday law have come? Shouldn't Revelation 18 have been fulfilled in Jones' day? They were no more prepared for it then than we were prepared for Nashville to be attacked on July 18th. Okay. So there is a work that's being done, but it's not sufficient. Right. And we know it's not sufficient because we see what follows afterwards. Uh, after 1893, we see quite clearly the fruit of, of the rebellion against God. So it's, it's, this work is going to continue. People might have bring, brought, had, had conviction. They might have repented and confessed their sins. They might have been convicted by the Spirit of God and a work begun, but that work did not continue. They were aroused, but not enough to actually take this work upon them. They weren't ready. And so what we see here is a typical line, and we know partly why they weren't ready is because the rejection of the first and second angel's messages. You know, the way that I, I looked at it, and I've looked at it this way for a long time, is I, I tried to understand why Jones and Wagner, even though they were God's appointed messengers, and this is before I was in this movement, tried to understand why the work that they were doing, that they were given to do, why they did not fulfill it. Why did they fall away? Wagner much more than Jones. They had the truth. God had, had chosen them, appointed them as messengers, Ellen White says. They were God's appointed messengers to give a message. And yet that message failed. And, and often, how do we look at the reason that the message failed? What, what's the typical reason Adventists, conservative Adventists will give why the 1888 message failed? Who's to blame? They try to blame Jones and Wagner. Okay, well, so you do have some trying. I'm not, I'm thinking about conservative Adventists. The church blames Jones and Wagner. And, and in some ways, they, they're partly right in, in, in some ways. But I think what, what we tend to do as conservatives, we just say, well, the church rejected the message. Yeah, it says my internet connection is unstable. That's odd. Right. But the the situation is that the church wants to say that they didn't reject the message. Okay. But we also... Too many see, times... Yeah. Okay. No, go ahead. So we know that, Jones, we know that Jones and Wagner weren't they weren't truly converted. That there is a failure on their part. Now, part of the failure is the opposition that they received. That brought a discouragement to Jones. Jones started to become, especially after 1893, much more earnest. Right? If you look at the 1895 General Conference Bulletin, which we're going to, uh, we, we're going to see that there now is more opposition than he had experienced before. You, you start to see him fighting an uphill battle. And he starts to take it personally. Especially happens after 1900, 1903, 1905. He really starts to take it personally. That is, he himself uses the power of, of men instead of the power of the gospel. That is, he trusts in the power of men rather than the power of the gospel, the power of God. 
to accomplish its work. He loses patience. And that's a danger all of us have. Because what happens when we're no longer patient? Don't we try to take things into our own hands? We Must do, have... but we're also, we're also revealing our own characters. But even somebody like Moses, must I fetch this water for you? He loses his patience. And this isn't something we can afford to do. We, we lose our influence. Jones and Wagner lost their influence. Wagner because of personal sins and Jones because he just became unbearable for many people. He had defects in character that he was not correcting and rejecting counsels in the spirit of prophecy, sometimes accepting them for a short time. But again and again, he had to pass over the same ground of his character. So we know that this mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down with a message that's different, but the same as the message of Revelation 14, verse 8. That is, the second angel comes with a message in our time. Now, Joan sees it here in this time, but it's not true that the Protestant churches have become the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. They haven't fallen yet morally to the point that, they, that we see today. I mean, really, the Christian churches of that time would be appalled at looking at the so-called conservative churches in our time. They would almost recognize nothing Christian. So it took time, once you become Babylon, to truly come to the point that the churches have today. And Adventist churches are not much far behind. They're basically almost step in step with the world. It used to be the Adventist church was about 20 years behind the world. In some ways, they're almost ahead of the world. Um, yeah, and eight, it, uh, Angela asked a question, is it in the 1888 materials um, where Elamite lamented the opposition by the church that discouraged Jones and Wagner and was to blame for their eternal black backsliding. Um, I'm not exactly where that is. I mean, it probably is in the 1880 materials. Um, but yeah, there is a responsibility held by those that rejected the message, but there's also a responsibility before the messengers themselves. It doesn't make Jones and Wagner um, it doesn't clear them of their responsibility and what they fail to do. And so we can't repeat the mistakes of the past. Now, Jones goes on, he says, and see the seventh plague, the seventh angel poured his vial onto the earth or, in, or poured his vial into the air. And there came a voice out of the temple in heaven from the throne saying, it is done. Now, when we talk about the seventh angel pouring his vial into the air, now, where do we place that? I mean, I know where Adventists generally try to place it, but where do we place it? Daniel 12. Okay, the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a voice out of the temple in heaven from the throne saying, it is done. And there were voices, thunderings, lightnings. There was a great earthquake, 
such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nation fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness <laughs> of his wrath. So this is um, uh, what verse is this? Um, somebody had a comment? This is Revelation 16. But doesn't that parallel with Daniel 12? Okay, well, this isn't the close of probation. I mean, it depends where you're talking about Daniel 12, because this is the seventh plague. And when we look at the sixth plague, the sixth plague is the Battle of Armageddon. Right? That's going to be the river Euphrates being dried up. Right, so the sixth angel is pouring his vial upon the great river Euphrates. And we see three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Now, when we have the seventh plague, um, it says, you know, every island fled away, the mountains were not found, and there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Now, where do we place the seventh plague? Where do we place the sixth plague? See, Jones seems to be getting ahead of himself here, right? Because we're going to have the close of probation. We're going to have these plagues going on. And, and he's now focused upon Babylon, right? This call to come out of Babylon. So he says the judgments of God are going to come upon Babylon. So that's all the plagues, right? Not just the sixth plague or the seventh plague. But we see in the sixth plague, these three spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. That's Babylon, the city that's divided into three parts. So when we see the voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done, what is done? When they say it is done, is that not Christ standing up? No. Because Christ stands up in Daniel 12, 1, and he right. says, In that is righteous, be righteous still. Then we have the plagues for it. So remember, on the Day of Atonement, um, we know that um, when, when, when Michael stands up, he's going to be doing the work, because we're in the Day of Atonement now since October 22nd, 1844. And so we understand that this work of investigation is going on and that Christ is going to stand up. And when he does that, he's going to confess the sins upon the head of the scapegoat. And the scapegoat's going to be led by fit, fit men into the wilderness, right? And we studied before when we were doing um, and examining the foundation series <coughs> that it's in that period of time that Satan is seeking to escape the hand of Christ or the fit man, right? Because this is all just in type, it's in symbols. So Satan is seeking to escape. And if he did escape, he would be successful. Right? And it's during the time of this plagues that this test is occurring.
So when he says it is done, what particularly, because he's already done the work of the day of atonement of declaring who's righteous and who's, who's unrighteous. He's already confessed the sins on the head of the scapegoat. But now in the seventh plague, he's going to say it is done. So what are these plagues that he can now say it is done? Are they not the last judgments on the world? Okay, so the, the, the seven last plagues are done, right? Right. And we Correct. know there's going to be, you know, there's going to be the special resurrection. There's going to be uh, the gods telling us the day and hour of Christ returning. And Christ is going to return. And then we're going to have the thousand years. And then you're going to have the great white throne judgment afterwards when all the the dead are raised up. But when he says it is done here, we know it is done at the cross. It is finished. We also know he says it is done at other times in salvation history. So something is done here. Now, we know that when the sins are confessed upon the head of the scapegoat, that these plagues are representing this period of time in which Satan is seeking to escape. And what does Satan have to do to escape in practical terms? I mean, he's not a goat. So what is he doing to escape the hands of Christ, of the fit man? Because he has these judgments come upon him. But it's not just that the plagues are done. I mean, the plagues are representing something. Have God's people passed the test? Has Christ's character been perfectly reproduced in his people? Yeah. Uh, By that point, yes. Yes. So this is what is done. It's just like uh, how Christ accomplished a work upon the cross. The same words that went from Christ's lips go from the lips of the 144,000. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's the sixth plague. That's the death decree. So when the seventh angel pours his vial into the air, God is going to declare that the character of Christ is perfectly reproduced in his people. The end of the world is coming. Because God's people have passed the test. The work of Christ is now complete. Um, we're directed to uh, Jeremiah 25, uh, 15. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, take the wine cup of this fury at my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it. And they shall drink and be moved and be mad because of the sword that I will send among them. Then I took the cup at the Lord's hand and made all the nations to drink unto whom the Lord had sent me to wit Jerusalem and the cities of Judah and the kings thereof and the princes thereof to make them a desolation an astonishment and a hissing and a curse as it is this day. Right. So we can see that this is used, this language is used as far as judgments against God's people and the nations. And, and in the context here, this is going to be uh, the 70 years that is, are going to be talked about. Right? Jeremiah 25 is going to talk about the 70 years that the king of Babylon will uh, be doing his work. And then at the end of the seven years, that he's going to punish the king of Babylon and that nation for their iniquity. So even though they're used to punish God's people, they're also going to be punished themselves. Now, one thing that he, Jones leaves out here is that the next thing we see 
after give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath is the hail. And, and I think this is the one thing that, um, that we often misunderstand in Revelation when we deal with the plagues. Now, the plagues have a literal aspect to it, but they are also symbolic. Like we don't take the three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet as literal, do we? No. Yeah. So when we have this great hail come out of heaven, um, what does the hail rep represent? If we do a study on the word hail, Now, we know the hail first occurs in the plagues of Egypt, right, which is, of course, literal. Right. Isaiah 28, 17 says, judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet, and the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies and the water shall overflow the hiding place. So what is this hail? Isn't it destruction upon their um doctrines okay well what is hail chunks of ice okay is it a stone that's made without hands yes okay so we know that a stone without made without hands going to come and strike the foot of the image the Babylon will be destroyed yeah. by the hail, right? And could we not say that the hail represents the character of Christ perfectly re reproduced in his people? We could. Okay. That this is God's kingdom, right? This is the stone that's cut out without hands that's going to grow into a mountain that's going to fill the whole earth. Because if we're going to take this literally, it makes no sense. We're not expecting hail to fall, just like we're not expecting three unclean spirits like frogs to come out of some symbols like the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, because they're symbols. And, and Book of Revelation is written in symbolic language. So this is a great hail out of heaven. It's something that comes that's going to cause um, a destruction. And it is the character of Christ in his people that causes the destruction of Babylon. What was the verse in Jeremiah? Well, the verse that we looked at in Jeremiah was addressing, uh, the, that was uh, Jeremiah 25, 15 and on. And then we had in Isaiah 28, verse 17, where hail shall sweep the refuge of lies. So we had that in Isaiah. So this is the fierceness of God's wrath, the cup of his wrath. Um, that Jones is talking about here. But we can see that Babylon, the judgment that comes upon Babylon, cannot occur without Christ's character being re perfectly re reproduced in his people. So here's what I see the problem is for Seventh-day Adventists. We expect that one day the Sunday law is going to come along and somehow we're going to be on the right side of the issue. But the Sunday law is a response to something that is happening in God's church, right? Can you have the death decree if 
if God's people have not been declared righteous by God? And you, can you have God's people being declared righteous if they haven't accepted the gospel, if they haven't given the loud cry, if they haven't passed the test? You just can't have Christ come back because time is just gone, right? He's not going to just arbitrarily come back to this earth. He comes back to this earth because a work is accomplished. This work, which is illustrated in so many ways, the work of the sanctuary, the day of atonement, All of these prophetic lines are all illustrating this work that has to be accomplished. And if we want to be on the right side of the issue, we first have to be converted. We, we first, the, first, that issue has to exist. The Sunday law is not going to come about if God's people are not able to pass that test. In a sense, the Sunday law comes about because God's people are ready to pass the test. Correct? Exactly. Right. So when we talk about a Sunday law coming and we're unconverted, we're, dis we're, we're, we're a movement that has is completely at odds with each other. We can't expect that the Sunday law is going to come. There has to be a work that's accomplished first. And, and this movement has illustrated the Sunday law with the pandemic, but we've also illustrated a church that has not yet accomplished its work. Jones is illustrating this as well. He's illustrating the same thing that we illustrated. So he asked the question, then where are we in that line? Is that the question that we need to ask? And do we think we're way over there at the death decree in the sixth or seventh plague? Are we looking for the judgments to come upon Babylon when we haven't actually done the work that we've been asked to do? We can't look for the judgments to fall until the work is complete. Right. So we need to ask the question, where are we in that line? But we have to have the correct answer to that question. So he says, by the direct line of the history of God's dealings with the nations, our nation stands today exactly where the other nations of the world have stood when they turned their backs upon God and refused to seek him any longer. We knew what came upon them and is certainly ruin awaits this nation and the influence of this nation reaches all the world therefore when ruin comes upon this nation it comes upon also upon all the world when these churches which should call <coughs> excuse me which should call the people and nations to seek the lord have followed the example of apostasy and forsaken the lord and taught men to depend upon earthly power then what is the use of them any longer in the world None. And what hangs over the churches? Destruction only by the judgments of God. But there are people, there are people of God in them. And before the final fall and ruin, God will call them out. But that which calls them out is the third angel's message, the loud cry of the third angel's message. Then where are we, brethren? We are in the loud cry. Oh, then let that loud voice be heard. Now, now, Jones, Jones understands this partly. He doesn't understand it fully, right? So he looks at the loud cry of the third angel. What does he mean by that? And we know what Ellen White talks about the loud cry of the third angel, right? 
Um, here is uh, Christian experience and teachings of Ellen G. White. So this is uh, on page 177. It says, um, Okay, there's a little bit here probably should read before. Okay, the numbers of this company had lessened. So this is a company after the Council of the True Witness to the Laodiceans. Uh, some people do not bear this straight testimony. They rise up against it. Uh, and then she says, I saw the testimony of the True Witness has not been half heeded. Right? Said the angel, list ye, or listen, Soon I heard the voice like many musical instruments, all sounding in perfect strains, sweet and harmonious. It surpassed any music I had ever heard, seeming to be full of mercy, compassion, and elevating holy joy. It thrilled through my whole being, said the angel, look ye. My attention was then turned to the company I'd seen who were mightily shaken. I was shown those whom I had before seen weeping and praying in agony of spirit. The company of guardian angels around them had been doubled, and they were clothed with an armor from head to their, their head to their feet. They moved in exact order like a company of soldiers. Their countenances expressed the severe conflict which they had endured, the agonizing struggle they had passed through. Yet their features, marked with severe internal anguish, now shone with the light and glory of heaven. They had obtained the victory, and it called forth from them the deepest gratitude the holy and holy sacred joy. The numbers of this company had lessened. Some had been shaken out and left by the way, the careless and indifferent who did not join with those who prized victory and salvation enough to perseveringly plead and agonize for it, did not obtain it. And they were left behind in darkness and their places were immediately filled by others taking hold of the truth and coming into the ranks. Evil angels still pressed around them but could have no power over them. I heard those clothed with the armor speak forth the truth with great power. It had effect. Many had been bound, some wives by their husbands and some children by their parents. The honest who had been prevented from hearing the truth now eagerly laid hold upon it. All fear of their relatives was gone and the truth alone was exalted to them. They had been hungering and thirsting for truth. It was dearer, and more precious than life. I asked what had made this great change. An angel answered, it is the latter rain, the refreshing from the presence of the Lord, the loud cry of the third angel. So when we look at this loud cry of the third angel, what is it? It's the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans, is it not? Exactly. And when we look at the Council of the True Witness to the Laodiceans, this is a message that comes from the spirit of prophecy. Would we agree with that? What else would it be? Okay. Well, is it also a message, a prophetic message? Because, you know, we all have the spirit of prophecy. We all, all have the books of Ellen White. We can read them. And we know that there's this straight testimony that's in her word. But we also know that there is this work that has to occur and that there is going to be a this other angel that's going to join the third angel and that it's going to swell into a loud cry. Now, as Seventh-day Adventists, when we look at this, this issue of, of what it's going to be, I mean, we, we can all know it's, it's the testimony of the true witness. It's the true witness to the Laodiceans, the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. And that is in the spirit of prophecy itself. But what makes the change? What, what powers this angel 
so that this message swells into a loud cry, according to what we read. Is there not those any... Who's... Yep, go on. Go ahead. I was going to say those whose characters have become perfectly aligned with Christ's. Okay, so there's an experience that occurs. Now, when we look at that experience, I think part of the problem that we've had as Seventh-day Adventists is what, what is the catalyst for that experience? But we know in this movement that that catalyst is a repetition of the first and second angels' messages, correct? Exactly. And we are part of prophecy that is being fulfilled. That we are experiencing history. We are experiencing the lines. We are experiencing what our pioneers experienced. And yet we, we don't want to experience it in this movement. We know we're repeating history, but when we're repeating history, we fight against it. So much so that we actually do repeat history, but we repeat the wrong side of that history. Just like December 6, 2020, they basically were fulfilling prophecy. You know, they got a 126 right there. And they choose that day to write their declaration, to publish their declaration. They were so blinded that they could fulfill prophecy, that they could do the very work that we had seen in history that we knew we shouldn't be doing. But is this movement also continuing to do that? Because we're going to fulfill history one way or another. We're either going to choose Christ or we're going to choose Barabbas. We're either going to seek the power of God, the gospel, or we're going to seek the power of man. So there's no way that you can avoid history. History is always going to catch up with you. So Joan says, then there are three more lines tonight, just as distinct as the three we had last night, which shut us up to the third angel's message as it reads. And we're not going to go into that right now. So we're going to look at that uh, in more detail uh, tomorrow afternoon. So that we'll pick this up tomorrow afternoon at two o'clock, my time. Um, any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we know that we have to come out of Babylon, that we need the power of your gospel, not the power of men, not man's wisdom, but yours. And Lord, we seek your power in our lives. We know, Lord, that we all have needs. We need health. We pray for Heidi that she can continue to heal, that you can give her health. Uh, we pray for others, Lords, others, Lord, who um, may be suffering in various ways. We know, Lord, that we do not reflect your character that we often have sought the power of men rather than the power of God, rather than your power. And so we ask for forgiveness. We ask that you can use us, even though we know that we are unlike you, 
but that somehow your character can shine through. We pray for this movement. We know, Lord, a work needs to be done upon our hearts, and we don't know how to do it upon another's heart, only our own. And so we ask that we can individually seek you. We just pray, Lord, that that can have an influence upon those around us, an influence for good. Be with us uh, through this night. We pray for the meetings tomorrow, for Dwight's meeting, and um, for the afternoon meeting and other meetings that may be going on. We pray that your, your Holy Spirit's power can be present. We pray for the events that are coming upon us in the next few months. And we know, Lord, that you have foreseen all things. Help us to be ready. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.